So thankful for the worship team's contribution to worship, their hard preparation, is, and how they generously share their considerable talent. Today we continue a sermon series on the Apple TV series, Ted Lasso, and taking some of the lessons um, from Ted Lasso. And today I'd like to do so by reading from Romans chapter 12. And let me just give a bit of an introduction to the book of Romans. It is late in the Apostle Paul's ministry. He's undergone a lot of persecution, um, has developed some of his theology and grown in his understanding of faith. And he goes through these grand treatises and grand ideas all through the book of Romans. And then at the beginning of chapter 12, he says, therefore, it's because God has done all these uh, astonishing things through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, he says, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice. That's the context for the reading that we will have now. So hear now the word of God. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone, evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, so far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Do not revenge, take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. May God add understanding and insight to this word, which uh, the reformer Martin Luther called the gospel in miniature. Pee Wee Reese was among my father's favorite baseball players. He played for the Brooklyn Dodgers in the 1940s before franchise owner Walter O'Malley sold his soul and moved the team to Los Angeles, a decision for which my father never forgave him. Reese was great. He was great year in and year out. He was the Dodgers' captain, the heart of the team, but he's in this sermon because of something that he did at a critical time in American history. No African American baseball player had played in the Major League Baseball up until that point. And in 1947, the Dodgers brought Jackie Robinson to Brooklyn. And the reaction in both the country and in baseball was immediate and it was visceral. Reese, the captain of the team, was a Southerner, and another Southerner on that team, Dixie Walker, circulated a petition among the players protesting Robinson's presence on the field as well as in the clubhouse, and Reese refused to sign. And everywhere the Dodgers went, fans and opposing teams booed and they shouted insults at Robinson. And early in the season, the Dodgers were in Boston to play the Braves, which were then there, and the Braves players started to heckle Reese for being a Southerner and playing beside a black man. Reese didn't answer them. He didn't even look at them. Instead, he walked over to Robinson and he put his arm around his shoulder and began to talk to him. Robinson later said it was the gesture that changed absolutely everything. Now, unfortunately, that gesture did not make things easy for Reese either. He endured threats, jeers, and hecklers at every stop throughout his career. People were afraid to hire him, afraid to coach him, afraid to house him. And yet Reese never lashed out. He never retaliated, nor did he minimize his relationship with his friend Jackie Robinson. And a statue now stands in Coney Island Park commemorating this symbolic act. Now, I don't know how Reese developed the moral courage needed to express this unpopular conviction. Maybe it came as a gift from God, which is often how it shows up, just kind of wrapped up like a gift that's delivered to us when we most need it. Maybe Reese had a well-worn Bible. We don't know. 
and had read it thoroughly enough to be well acquainted with the 12th chapter of Romans. I'm not sure, but either way, his actions are powerful for the simple reasons that they contradicted the human impulse to hate and embraced the risky power of love. Who among us hasn't been smacked in the cheek or assaulted with a nasty comment or deceived by a friend or a coworker and not been tempted to exact some kind of revenge? Revenge is just this built-in thing that seems to have a relationship to our another built-in sense of justice that we have. We know, or at least We think we know when we are the victim. So when we have the chance to implement a literal justice of our own, our commitment to love just vaporizes and our commitment to justice intensifies. And yet wisdom suggests that we walk a little carefully when we think we understand justice because a bit of intellectual modesty and a touch of moral humility can go a long way toward making space for God's sensibilities on this topic. The problem is, is we all experience the pain of injustice, wrongs done to us, wrongs done to our loved ones, but we have to decide how we are going to respond. Now, I imagine that most of us here today, most of us who are online today, are familiar with the idea of scruples. We will say something like, well, I have my scruples. And and by that, we're usually saying, well, I have these values or these principles that are going to cause me to take a stand against something that I think is wrong. And it's important because we stand up for a sense of what is right and what is fair. But the word scruples comes from the Latin word scrupulous, which literally denotes a small, sharp stone. So the phrase to stand on our scruples comes from the idea of being bothered by a small, sharp stone in our shoe. So the implication really is that when we decide we have to stand on our scruples, our principles, our convictions about what is right and what is wrong, that we also stand with sensitivity. We stand with tender feet. We don't stomp our foot and march forward confident in our own convictions. We walk tenderly. We walk lightly and carefully. In our scripture reading today, the Apostle Paul lays out a whole set of tender-footed scruples, small, sharp stones in the shoes of Christian people that encourage us to keep our scruples, but to walk with careful sensitivity. Let love be genuine, he says. Hate what is evil, but hold fast to what is good and love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't lag in zeal. Be ardent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. And then Paul sums up this beautiful treatise on the Christian life with a much more difficult ethic of loving and blessing. And blessing literally means bestowing goodness on another. So love and blessing our enemies. Did you hear that when Paul said it? Bless those who persecute you. Bestow goodness on them, he says. Bless and and do not curse them. Don't repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in sight of all. And if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Don't avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Don't become overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. (laughs) What, What a teaching. Have you ever tried to work that out in your marriage or in the courtroom or in the classroom or in the boardroom? The point for today is that at the end of his ministry, Paul has assessed the core principles of Jesus' life and ministry, the core teachings of the gospel, and Paul explicitly rules out any use of revenge. Personal vengeance is excluded. Retaliation is forbidden. And in its place, Paul does not call for passivity or conflict avoidance. Paul was certainly no doormat. He teaches Christ followers, Christians, you and me, 
to actively bless our enemies with kindness, to feed them, nurture them, give them safe harbor. And that's hard to do when it is deeply personal, when a spouse disappoints or a child offends or a coworker deceives. And yet history suggests that Paul understands that real power, transformative power, lasting power actually resides in the power of love. In the fifth episode of Ted Lasso, um, a fifth episode of season one of Ted Lasso, Ted and his wife, Michelle, have uh, separated, and it's at her insistence. And she has now flown across the pond to visit him in London, and she's gone to formalize the end of their relationship. And everything about Ted Lasso wants to stay married, to work things out, not to quit, never quit. Because his father quit on life, and Ted can't think of anything worse than his own son thinking that Ted quit on him. And yet when Michelle delivers the news that she simply doesn't love Ted anymore, that their marriage is finally over, he digs deep and responds with astonishing grace. Let's watch. So critics of Tad Lasso and critics of the Apostle Paul say that they're softer than the Pillsbury Doughboy. And, you know, they they need to man up. I mean, you just can't go through life with relentless commitment to kindness. But, But here's what's so easy to miss. Paul is absolutely full of justice. He simply places the burden of justice exclusively in the hands of the one who is to implement it. Both the Old and the New Testaments pronounce the same idea. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Vengeance is not yours to do with whatever you want. So many scripture passages attest to God settling scores on some future day when all things are going to be made right. But scripture never suggests that it's up to us to balance the scales of justice through the use of vendetta or revenge. Only God has that responsibility. This grows out of Paul's deepest understanding of the Christian life. And if you'll dive with me for just a moment into the deepest Christian theology, Paul suggests that in the Christian life, everything about us belongs to God. Our bodies, our hearts, our emotions, our money, even the wrongs we suffer don't belong to us. They belong to God. And if we hold on to them for the basis of hurt and bitterness, then we are actually encroaching onto divine territory, which is very rarely a good idea. So to be Christian is to turn them over, is to entrust their resolution to the one who holds everything else about our lives and then let God get to work on it. When Ted Lasso uh, uh, first arrives in England to coach the Richmond Football Club, team owner Rebecca warns him about a crusty sports reporter named Trent Krim. Krim is famously difficult and he's sure to give Ted a hard time, and yet Ted has a plan for how he's going to deal with this difficult guy. Let's see. And I think that's exactly what Pee Wee Reese and Jackie Robinson did to all those racists who were spewing hate their way. They dipped those tough cookies in milk, the milk of God's transforming love, and trusted God to deal with them. And it's what Lasso did with Krim, and, and it's what we can do with the difficult people and circumstances in our lives. The question is not whether it works or whether it doesn't. We, we actually know that it works. The real question is whether or not we're willing to give it a try. And each of us has to decide. And I hope and pray that God will give us the strength and the wisdom and the faith to decide well. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we pray that you would grant each of us the strength to do that which is terribly difficult. Give us a new way to let go of revenge. Pull it from the clench of our fists. Help us to trust that your greater wisdom on righting those wrongs will prevail. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen.